right. Hello, Gerwinder. It's great to have you. It's a pleasure to be here, Mark. I'm a huge fan of your animations, so I Thank love you. To this conversation. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. So by the time this podcast comes out, our collaboration will come out. And I'm, I'm so excited because it's our second collaboration. And I absolutely love your writing. It makes you stop and think for a, a long time and you write about irrational behavior. And I thought we could maybe Thank start you. this podcast by just defining what irrational behavior is or what is irrationality. Okay. So in order to define irrationality, we need to define rationality. And rationality is the use of intelligence to pursue objective truth. That's how I define it anyway. Obviously, different people may define it in different ways, but I've found that this definition that I've just given uh, tends to cover all the bases, I think, of rationality. So if that's what rationality is, then irrationality is going to be the sort of opposite of that or the, the lack of that. So it's going to be um, the use of intelligence to seek goals that are sort of inimical to objective truth, that are sort of that are a hindrance to objective truth. So it could be uh, the pursuit of subjective truth, or it could be the pursuit of any other goal that is not objective truth. Um, and I think when we define it like that, a lot of stuff starts to make sense because irrationality is, is the norm in human behavior. Rationality is something, is the exception. It's, it's the sort of minority sort of thing in this massive sea of irrationality. Uh, and so it's, it's much better to define irrationality more broadly, I think, because it covers all of the different aspects of human behavior than, uh, because rationality is only a tiny sliver of human behavior. It's, it's only, we're only rational when we're actively pursuing objective truth. And that happens very rarely in life. It really does. Why, why do you think pursuing truth is such a rare thing to pursue? Well, because our brains didn't evolve for it. Um, you know, we, we evolved for survival. We evolved for procreation. So, you know, we evolved, we did evolve the ability to tell truth, but only insofar as it helped us survive. So we are good at, for instance, um, knowing that you shouldn't jump off a cliff, you know, <laughs> because obviously that's going to kill you. And that's that's truth. That's truth. We know that if we were to jump off, off a cliff, we would die. Um, and so that, that we have that kind of truth. And we can also tell the difference between um, something like two different types of fruit, for instance. One fruit may be poisonous. One is good for us. You know, if we if we see somebody eat the, the bad fruit and die, we're getting truth from that. We're learning, you know, we're, we're learning what, what evolutionary psychologists call veridical truth, which is the kind of truth that enables you to survive. So we have that amount of truth. You know, we have we have the basics to predict certain things about the future. But any more than that is not evolutionary uh, benefit. It's, it's, not, it's not an evolutionary benefit because it takes too much energy and too much time to discern truths beyond the basic sort of living. So things like metaphysical truth, th things like, um, you know, uh, what is the meaning of life? Those kinds of truths are not, they're not going to benefit our survival. And so they're also evolutionarily costly. They, they take a lot of energy. They take a lot of time. And in order to um, sort of minimize energy costs and time costs, which are um, essential to survival, evolution tended to sort of create our brains, streamline our brains in such a way that we are good at answering basic questions like the ones that I was uh, just posing, uh, the difference between two, two fruits or what would happen if you jump off a cliff. Evolution allows us to determine those truths, but it doesn't equip our brains to deal with anything more than that simply because it's, it's not, it doesn't have survival benefit. And I think it's very important to understand the basis of irrationality and biases and prejudices. They are all energy saving uh, heuristics. You know, the brain uses heuristics because energy costs and time costs were some of the biggest bottlenecks in evolution. They were the things that really prevented um, people from surviving. If you take too long to react to a tiger charging at you, you're dead. And likewise, if you are using 
crazy amounts of energy just to perform basic calculations in your brain. You're going to starve or you're going to exhaust yourself to death. So the time and energy costs had to be minimized in our evolutionary history. And the way that the brain did that was by streamlining the brain, preventing it from posing too many questions and just focusing on the here and now and on basic survival. So that, that's the basic. That's really why we are irrational, because the brain didn't evolve for, for evolution. Sorry, the, the brain didn't evolve for truth. It evolved for survival. Mm. When, when I heard you saying that, I, I'm immediately thinking of uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And anytime yeah. you talk about survival, you're talking about like the very bottom of that pyramid. I can throw it up here well, over the uh, conversation. But as we get above the survival level, I think truth, objective truth becomes maybe less of a priority. Like if you, if, if telling a lie gets you closer to having a friendship, then you might do that. Like as you go up higher, like we're talking about, as you go up higher on the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you get to like safety, friendship, family, love, your reputation in the community, those things, you know, you can get pretty far away from the truth and play these status games and build up your reputation like we see in politics. You know, the truth does not seem very important to politicians. Getting reelected and their reputation is the priority. So you can get pretty irrational Absolutely. pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're perfectly right. Um, truth doesn't really actually have much value to humans, <laughs> sadly enough, uh, above the basic truths of you know, surviving. Um, being believed is a lot more important in society than telling the truth. And so we are pretty good at that. We're pretty good at convincing people. We're pretty good at forming arguments that may not necessarily be rational arguments, but which are nevertheless persuasive. Uh, we're good at creating illusions both for other people and for ourselves. We can also deceive ourselves. Um, and ultimately, one of the issues is, is that since truth has very little value, there's, no, there's not much space for it in everyday interactions between people. Um, like, as you said, you know, truth is not really important to climb the sort of Maslow's hierarchy. Um, it's only good, the only real value of truth is in its ability to help us predict the future. That, that's really the main thing that truth offers us. It can help us, I should probably be more accurate and say consistently predict the future, because anybody can do it by accident. But to consistently predict the future, you need truth. That's the only real thing that truth can do, which lies cannot. Because you can't bullsh bullshit your way to predicting things, you know. And, and so if you're not in a field that doesn't require you to predict the future, then truth has no real value. You know, <laughs> uh, other than as a sort of vanity exercise, you may want to know the truth just because it it's a nice idea you know it's nice idea to have the truth but ultimately it has no practical value in fields where you don't need to predict the future and so for this reason this is why, one reason why i'm skeptical of any field that doesn't require any kind of predictions um you know if you look at for instance history history doesn't require any predictions you don't have to really predict you can't well you can kind of predict the past but it's not the same um a historian, what, what a historian can do, or even, this is also true of evolutionary psychology to an extent, is you could create a just-so just so story. So you look at the facts first, and then from the facts, you can create any kind of story you want to explain those facts. So if you're looking at history and you, you look at a site uh, in the middle of nowhere where, people, where a city once existed, and you can find some facts on the ground, and then from those facts, you can conjure any story you want to explain it. And so what you're doing is you've got the facts first and then you're explaining the story, you're explaining with the story. So you don't, there's no difference between having a false story and a true story in that, in, in that scenario because you're not predicting anything. You know, you're just explaining something that already existed. And so that's why a field like history is, is quite replete with a lot of this kind of, this, this, this stuff. But if you're trying to make a prediction about something that's happening in the future, you can't just make up a story. You can't just explain it, you know, you can't explain the future with, with any, any story of your own choosing. You have to have a real accurate story. That's the only story that's gonna explain the, fu the, the future. And so that's why I think um, 
a lot of academia and particularly the humanities does have this issue where a lot of it's about explaining things that have already happened rather than trying to predict things that haven't. And when you're explaining things that have already happened, you can say anything you want. You can you can make any explanation you want. And it you know, nobody can really dispute it unless they actually have some kind of countervailing evidence, which is rare. Um, whereas when you look at the physical sciences, you look at physics, chemistry, and to an extent biology, they have to make predictions about the future. They have to say, oh, okay, so if you're a physicist, you, you obviously, you're designing uh, an aircraft and you know, if that, you can't just bullshit your way to designing an aircraft. That aircraft is either gonna fly or it's not. And the only way to make it fly is to actually do real physics, to do the truth, you know, then that way you can predict that it's gonna fly. Uh, if you're in chemistry, the same with, you know, two chemicals, if you mix them together, you have to know what's going to happen. You know, if you're, if you're putting chemicals into a person's body, for instance, you can't bullshit your way to healing that person. You know, you, you have to actually know the science. So you have to make the, the accurate predictions there as well. So there's the difference between physical sciences and pretty much every other discipline. And I'm not knocking the other disciplines. I think the other disciplines are important. You know, the social sciences are important geography, history, all of these fields, they do give us knowledge, but they, they, are, they do have this problem where, because they're not making predictions, they do sometimes make predictions, but they don't always make predictions. And when they're not making predictions, they tend to sort of have these just so stories. That's a really interesting observation. I, I have been noticing a, a split in academia as well. It seems like there's these hard STEM fields and then there's everything else. And the problem with a lot of majors in college, I see, is that they're they're talking about like social issues or current issues and they're really focused on like gender studies or something. It's it's focused on the like current ideology of gender studies. And in five years, everything that we're talking about is probably gonna be irrelevant. So that yeah. major, that degree doesn't stay relevant for very long. Whereas if you even something like music, if you learn how to play a saxophone in 20 years, you're still going to know how to play some songs. Like it's a, it's a yeah. concrete skill that you learn. And yeah. a lot of these majors, I guess you can call them BS majors. They just, it feels good to have a degree, but they don't really have much use to society because like you're yeah. saying, they, they can't predict much. They're just trying to like maybe reorganize the past, tell some other story about the past. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I think so. This is very interesting because this really goes to the heart of irrationality. Um, so fields like gender studies, for instance. So these are, are fields that primarily are not involved in the search for objective truth. Uh, they are. To some extent, they may be involved in um, social justice, so they may be trying to create a better world. They might be trying to create a more equ equitable world. Um, gender studies is one of these fields, in fact, because it, it sort of came out of feminism originally. Um, and from feminism, it sort of, uh, it changed to more towards trans rights. Um, when, when women sort of became on parity with men um, and when there was less need for uh, women's rights, gender studies sort of morphed into a more of a trans rights thing. Um, so it's basically followed the, the sort of the sort of social imperative, as it were. It's basically about trying to create a better world. So it's got noble intentions behind it. Uh, you know, it tr it's trying to create a better world. It's trying to create a more equitable world. Uh, unfortunately, because it's not involved in the search for truth, it often doesn't lead to any kind of social justice or anything. It, it doesn't really do anything for social justice because it's not able to make those predictions. It's not able to um, tell us anything concrete about the world. It can only engage in signaling behaviors. And that's probably what I would say is the primary uh, purpose of uh, academic fields like gender studies, is that they, they exist to signal to other people certain things. So they signal sophistication, they signal compassion. You know, if you are, um, if you're, obviously if you're uh, claiming to uh, look after women's rights, trans rights, it makes you look like a compassionate person. It makes you look like a good person, a sophisticated person, somebody who's uh, awake to uh, injustice, hence the term woke. Uh, so, you know, there's this very powerful signaling uh, sort of mechanism there. And I think touching on what you said about how the truth tends to 
last a long time. It tends to be pretty much eternal, whereas lies don't. This, I think, speaks to the importance of um, lies to f prevailing fashions. Uh, essentially, I think gender studies is a fashion. I think it's a fashion that I don't think that gender studies will exist in 50 years um, because I think it exists to essentially to to sort of it, it's a form of, of fashion in the sense that it it exists mainly as a status symbol so it exists to make certain people look good and to make them feel good and obviously the people who are in these fields would be angry at me for saying this and they would dispute it and they would say no no, no would, of course not you no, don't you don't know anything about it yeah they'll, they'll say no you know <laughs> they're, they're very we're, tolerant they're, yeah <laughs> yeah so and look i think maybe in their minds they genuinely believe that they're doing the right thing they genuinely believe that they're making the, the world a better place uh they genuinely think that they're helping i don't think that these people are bad people i just think that um they shouldn't really be academic fields because they're not involved in academia they're, they're active they're activists they're not academics and for me an academic or a scholar is somebody who's interested in the pursuit of truth and an activist is somebody who's trying to create political change or social change and these two things are often at loggerheads with each other they, they, they don't tend to play well they're like oil and water um, because once you make up your mind that you're trying to change the world then that that gives you the excuse to lie because you can just say oh it's all for the greater good you know I can tell this small lie because in the end it will be for the greater good and so you know I think a lot of people do do this in in the academic sort of uh, social sciences particularly and they'll even admit that they do this i mean if you look there's a i think last year in the summer there was a uh, article in published in nature and the editors of nature uh, sorry it wasn't in nature it was nature human behavior so it was it's a sort of sub um magazine with i think it's under the nature umbrella uh, but it's 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 nature human behavior that's the magazine's name but it's part of nature and nature is a very prestigious uh, science um, journal and um, so in this magazine last year in the, in the summer last year the editors basically came out and they published an editorial saying that they will uh, deliberately um, suppress scientific findings that are perceived to harm minorities um, they're, they're obviously you know what they deem to perceive to harm minorities could mean anything you know it could literally they're not even going to tell us what what it is they'll just suppress it they just won't you know they won't let anybody see it and they make the final call on what is harmful to minorities and what is not so you know they they're not even denying it they they will actively go out there and they will they will say like you know we don't want any scientific uh, experiments any discoveries anything which could be perceived to be harmful to uh, minorities or um or you know underprivileged groups or whatever so this is, you know, it shows that, you know, even academics, in fact, especially academics, are sort of capable of irrationality. And sometimes it's even deliberate, you know. <laughs> sometimes people are deliberately irrational um, because, like we were saying, you know, truth is only worth pursuing to the average person if there's some concrete benefit to it. And unfortunately, with academics, uh, there isn't much concrete benefit to pursuing truth. And that's why we have the replication crisis in academia right now. And it's why, um, you know, there's so many different forms of uh, manipulation. And this, you know, every month in the newspapers, there's an academic who's been outed as a fraud, you know, who basically um, completely concocted their, their experimental results. This happens, you know, mm. with startling regularity. What, what and so... You wonder you mentioned the replication crisis i've never i haven't heard of this crisis oh okay yeah so this is a major a major issue in in academia so um between sort of one third and one half of all studies cannot be replicated right and this is uh, in in sort of fields like uh, medicine in social sciences uh, less so in the physical sciences uh, and we, we can go on to that in a minute, but mainly in the social sciences and mainly in the humanities. But the the focus is really in, in the humanities, sorry, in, in the social sciences. So in the fields of psychology and sociology, um, there's a huge issue with trying to replicate studies. And why it's important to replicate studies is because 
it basically tells us how, how reliable the study is, how accurate it is, how trustworthy it is. So if somebody does an experiment and they, they come up with a certain finding, then if that finding is true, then you logic dictates that you should be able to replicate that finding by replicating the experiment. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen very often in psychology or in sociology now. And this is startling. I mean, over half of the studies, apparently, according to some sources, do not replicate. Um, and this is particularly a problem in social psychology, where you have most of the act activism, the, the sort of gender studies and, and, and all of that sort of stuff. So um, nobody really knows exactly why this is happening, but I think most people can guess. Uh, and it's largely due to things like p-hacking, um, which, which is... And, and data dredging, which is a related thing. And these are basically uh, forms of uh, statistical manipulation. So if you're an academic, you have the incentive to lie, unfortunately. Uh, you don't have the incentive to tell the truth because the truth is usually boring. And when you're an academic, you want to be exciting. You want, you want your experiments to be published in the New York Times. You want uh, to get grants from big companies. You want to have a big social media following. Uh, you want to be cited by lots of other academics. So because of these incentives, there is pressure on academics to sort of gin up their, their results, to sort of, you know, spice them up a little bit by manipulating the statistics a little bit. And so this is a very, very common occurrence within academia. You know, you have pretty much everyone uh, in the social sciences who's engaging in some form of statistical manipulation. Uh, some of these forms may be... Um, you know, sort of legit, they may be allowed. Um, but usually, I think that there's also uh, illicit uh, forms of manipulation. And, you know, p-hacking is when you sort of, uh, you sort of, I mean, you, you can basically, um, you can do run a, a variety of different statistical tests, and you can change the parameters of what of the data set until you get the result that you want. And then once you've got the result that you want, you can discard all the other ones that didn't work. And you could just say, oh, look, this is what I found, you know. <laughs> and so a lot of people are doing that. And they're, they're basically finding, everybody's finding amazing results. I mean, if you look at academia, right, uh, there's a great uh, meme, actually, that I found where it shows um, how pretty much every food that you can think of both causes and cures cancer right <laughs> so milk both causes and cures cancer um, cabbage causes and cures cancer according to different uh, studies right and and obviously this can't be true you know <laughs> and the reason that this is the case is because academics are manipulating statistical results because they want to get the big time they want their 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 study to be cited by the new york times saying you know cabbage causes cancer or whatever because then obviously their name is going to get big and then People are going to fund them and say, oh, you know, we want we want more, we want to find out more about this. You know, here's here's a million dollars, you know, do what you want. <laughs> so obviously there is a lot of incentives for academics to lie. And I mean, that's just one incentive. Then you also have the social justice incentive, which is another thing. And then you have other incentives. Um, for instance, there may be um, some kind of uh, someone might have paid you to come out with a certain result. And there's there's Project 226, which is a very, very um startling um, sort of conspiracy and this is a real conspiracy it's not a conspiracy theory so project 226 and it does it sound like it sounds like a conspiracy theory project 226 but it was um it was basically it was in the 1960s and there was a big uh, sort of uh, congregation of these massive uh, sugar companies and the sugar companies uh, basically were afraid of the latest research because the research was showing uh, that their sugar might be unhealthy. Um, and so they thought, oh, you know, we can't have this. You know, people won't buy sugar if, if everybody thinks sugar's unhealthy. So what they did was they hired um, lots of um, sort of uh, nutritionists, um, sorry, not nutritionists. They hired lots of uh, uh, sort of food biologists. I don't know what the, the precise term for a food biologist, not, not a nutritionist, but I guess it might be nutritionist, yeah. So they hired lots of these scientists, scientists anyway. And uh, they basically got them to do research into uh, fat, they, into fat and its negative effects on the human body. And they basically, what they did was they hired these people to do a hit job on fat and to basically blame all the negative effects of sugar on fat. 
So heart disease, for instance, heart disease was originally um, uh, sort of correlated with sugar consumption. And they didn't want that. They thought that's, that's you know, people are going to panic. So what they did is they got the researchers to instead label fat as the primary uh, reason why heart disease was the reason. And you can see it today. I mean, for even me, I believe for a long time that fat was the primary cause for heart disease, you know. And many people even today still believe that because it was taught in our schools. It was taught in schools. It was taught in universities. Even like, you know, the, the UN... Um, themselves the united nations they they also said it was fat you know don't don't consume too much fat because it will result in heart disease and all this we now know that you know fat itself is not the problem it's it's saturated fat you know if you have saturated fat that increases your ldl cholesterol which increases plaques and all that kind of stuff so we know that yes certain types of fats are bad for they do lead to heart disease but fat itself is actually it can be extremely healthy so olive oil for instance is extremely healthy avocados are very extremely healthy they're high in um Coconut, polyunsaturated fish, fats and all that so nuts. yeah but you know obviously yeah. if you were to read these studies in the 1960s they would they were basically labeling all fat as the the primary reason why people were getting heart disease so that people so that the sort of the the pressure would be taken off sugar so this shows that academics can be bought you know they can be bought to pretty much if you've got enough money, you can basically get the academics, the researchers to pretty much publish any finding you want, you know. So money is another reason. So there's there's money, there's politics, there's ego and status. So these are three incentives for why academics would lie and why we have the, the replication crisis. Uh, the manipulation techniques um, are so sort of vast and diverse. Um, you know, there's another thing as well, which is, is um, called... Um, uh, hypothesizing after the results are known. Um, so this is, is, is known as harking. And, and that's basically when academics will, um, they'll, they'll, come, they'll come up with some research and then based on their research, based on the findings, what they'll do is they'll change their hypothesis to, to match the, the results, to make themselves look more like they predicted the future. So. For instance, um, you know, somebody might say, um, "Oh, um, if you uh, if you eat cabbage, you'll get cancer, right?" So, <laughs> going back to that, so so um, you know, it, it, somebody might hypothesize that, right? And if it turns out that the cabbage does not cause cancer, then they'll change their original hypothesis, hypothesis to say, "Oh, well, my hypothesis is that cabbage does not cause cancer." So, so they they basically made it look like they predicted the the finding. So there's all, all kinds of um, manipulation techniques going on in academia. And, you know, this is why it's very hard to trust um, any of the research that's coming out in the social sciences. I mean, generally, systematic reviews and meta-analyses are, are better because what they do is instead of taking one study, they look at all of the published research in a, in a given field and then they use statistical analysis to um, sort of try and find patterns within this. But the problem is, is because they're using statistical analysis, they can also do the same things. They can use the p-hacking, you know, the data dredging. They can use all the same techniques to manipulate the results. And so even what is regarded as the gold standard, the, me the me meta-analyses, the systemic, um, systematic reviews, all of this stuff, even those can be manipulated. And so, again, you know, this is pretty scary stuff because academia is supposed to be the one field where you can, you know, where you're actually pursuing truth. It's the one field of human endeavor that is supposed to be dedicated to the, the pursuit of objective truth. And even this is filled with bullshit. So it goes to show how prevalent amongst the human population irrationality is. It's the norm. That's why, you know, going back to the original, I was, I was saying that it's the norm. It's the majority, the overwhelming majority of human affairs are irrational. And rationality is the exception. It's extremely r rare. That was a fantastic answer. And you covered Thanks. so many things that I, I was like scribbling down notes very quickly. And you reminded me of um, a video I did a while ago about uh, diets over time and how Kellogg's was really um, influential in the early, like the 1920s. And they paid for all these studies to condemn protein. And there was all these oh. studies saying how, how unhealthy protein is for us. And now, of course, that's ridiculous now. And there's, if you look at some of these really old studies, they're laughable because it says that smoking's really good. You know, nine out of 10 dentists <laughs> recommend smoking. And it seems absurd now, but 
it just shows. But of course, we think that today that can't be happening. You know, we think that our, our studies are flawless today, but 20 years from now, we're going to look back and say, boy, that didn't make sense. Um, yeah. And I'm wondering, like, what what real world harm are you seeing from these fake studies, from this irrational ideas that are happening within academia? How is that kind of spilling out and affecting society? Yeah. Um, I mean, so we could go back to what we were just saying about uh, the sort of nutrition stuff. So, you know, for a long period of time, there was the whole, there was the food pyramid and all that sort of stuff, you know. So people were told, you know, just have, you've got to have a certain portion of carbs, have a certain portion of proteins, have a certain portion of, of fats. Um, and it was like mainly carbs. You know, carbs was the, the big part, the, the bottom, the base of the pyramid. So it was carbs was like, you should, most of your diet should be carbs. And that's obviously harmed a lot of people because now we know that carbs and particularly refined carbs are actually re really bad for you. I mean, because they, they spike your your glucose levels uh, in your blood and um, they can contribute to weight gain um, more than fats in, in, in the typical diet. Um, and so, you know, if you're eating a lot of white rice and white bread and, you know, um, white pasta and all that sort of stuff, that's, that's actually really bad for you over the long term. It can lead to diabetes and, and many other issues. So, you know, that was obviously, that's one example of, of how this can uh, cause harm. And then uh, if you go into the sort of social justice stuff, you know, which is everywhere now as well. Um, recently, we, well, actually not recently, it was about six months ago. About six months ago, um, in the New York Post, there was uh, a story of an academic, uh, his name escapes me, but he was responsible for propagating a lot of the sort of systemic racism narrative. He was, you know, highlighting these, he was basically coming out with these studies which were showing um, disparities in outcomes between blacks and whites. Um, and he was one of the main figures behind the New York Times and Washington Post sort of publishing how there was uh, America systemically racist. It turns out uh, last year, I think it was in August um, or in July, it was in July and or August, uh, he was fired because it, was turn it turns out that pretty much all of his results were fabricated. Uh, he wanted to prove that America was systemically racist, but his experiments did not show evidence of systemic racism and so he he created his own results um and this went on for for i think about a decade he was a long-term uh, sort of favorite mm. of the new york times did you and things did like you that. hear so, about the um did you hear about the james Lindsay studies where he kind of gained the peer review <coughs> yeah, system yeah yeah that's yeah yeah famous. the so-called squared yeah so-called squared was, yeah. was also an example of this so the reason I'm bringing this up is because we were talking about harms and um, the harms of this is that if you teach people that the world is against them, you actually cause them a lot of stress. Um, so if you're going out there and you're, you're teaching black people, for instance, that uh, the world hates them, that uh, they can't ever achieve anything in life because white people are just going to hire white people over black people or, you know, if you're teaching people like this, you know, it's not good for people psychologically and it's not true either. Um, you know, you, if you are talented enough in life, then it doesn't matter what colour you are, you can achieve what you want to achieve. Because we live in a, a hyper capitalist society where employers want the best employees, you know, very, very few. I mean, there are racist people out there and there are racist business owners out there, no doubt. But they're a tiny, tiny minority. Uh, if you just look at the statistics, you know, there are plenty of non-white people in in good paying jobs. That's because we live in a hyper capitalist society where the main concern is getting the best people in the job. And if and most employers, I would say 99% of employers, they just want the best employee. They don't care about what color you are, you know. But if you were to read the New York Times or you were to read the, you know, the Washington Post, it's giving minorities, people like me, it's, it's telling people like me, oh, you know, don't even bother trying to get a good job because you're just going to, you know, you're going to get passed over in favor of a white person. You know, this is not a good message to be sending to people. And it's all based on flawed research. It's based on um, really, really s small scale studies with really poor samples, um, usually with manipulated results for effect. You know, um, obviously there, there's a bias. There's something called the bias against null results, which is um, one of the biggest contributors to the replication crisis. And the bias against null results is basically what it does is it, it, it what it means is it means that 
studies that show uh, some surprising thing will be favoured over studies that don't show it. So studies that show that America is systemically racist are going to be favoured over studies that show that America is not systemically racist. Because think about the headlines. If the New York Times publishes, study shows America is not systemically racist, it's not going to be that great. It's not going to get a lot. I mean, it would probably get a bit of outrage from the New York Times' uh, reader base because they're those kinds of people. But generally, it's not going to really, it's not going to blow blow up very much, you know. Uh, America yeah, is not that, that racist, study, you know what I mean? That study would not get past peer review either. Exactly. It wouldn't get past through yeah. peer review. And it's not, it's just not interesting, you know. New study shows America is not racist. That's not a particularly great study. But on the other hand, if you have new study shows America is racist, well, now you've got something interesting. Now you've got something that's going to be published in the New York Times. You know, now you've got something that's going to get people's attention on Twitter. So the, the bias against null results is basically that surprising findings will always be favoured over non-surprising findings. And this is true at the publication level. It's true at the peer review uh, level. It's true um, at the sort of incentive level as well. So people are incentive incentivized to come out with this also. So um, at every level, there is the bias against null results. And that's one of the contributors to this sort of the, the, the idea that America is, is systemically racist. And I'm, I'm not completely disputing that there are racist structures in place. There may be, I don't know. I'm not completely disputing that, but I'm saying that the evidence for it that I've seen personally, because I've actually looked into the evidence of this, I haven't seen any credible evidence for it. And yet, this is something that if you go on Wikipedia, it will tell you that America is definitely 100% systemically racist and it will cherry pick the studies. It won't, you won't, you know, the Wikipedia editors don't allow studies that disprove this or that dispute it. So uh, that's, well, yeah, that's one of the... the I, I completely agree with you. There's a lot of inconvenient uh statistics out there that they have to discard in order to yeah. make their case so like you have uh, asian americans this country i'm in america america was not built by asians it was not built for asians yet asians flourish here and yeah. you know if if this is a country built on white supremacy why are asians doing so well you know that's exactly kind of an inconvenient yeah thing. this is this is a very good point and it's one that i always it always puzzles me because pretty much all of the white supremacists, uh, all of the big name ones anyway, um, tend to sort of acknowledge that uh, whites actually don't have the, the, the best outcomes in society. They don't have the highest IQs in society. They don't have the highest um, sort of outcomes in, in general, you know, in terms of uh, criminal, criminal law and things like that. So, you know, uh, East Asians, so people like Chinese, Korean, Japanese, they tend to um, have the best outcomes in the legal system. They tend to have uh, the best socioeconomic outcomes. They tend to even um, have the best uh, sort of uh, outcomes in, in, in sort of longevity and, and things like that as well, uh, to a certain extent. And it, it's very odd because um, these are all of the things that are blamed on systemic racism. You know, the legal system, uh, the health system, uh, the, the, the economic system, all of this stuff is, is sort of supposed to be systemically racist. So if that's the case, why are... East Asians and, and Jewish people, that, that's another group that also does very well. Um, why are these well, groups? Everybody, uh, you know, everybody wants to talk about these disparities in wealth and in power and influence, yeah. but nobody wants to talk about disparities in effort and skill and yeah. talent. And, you know, how, how much effort did you put in? Did you put in 10 times more effort than that other person? Well, that might explain exactly. the disparity. So, you know, yeah. the world is not fair for sure. There's There's all sorts of privilege and things like that, but there's also another side to it there are people that are resilient and have exhibit their yeah. free will and they push themselves and that gets you where you want to go and that's it and, and i think like the way i look at it is i think that a lot of these people who do push the idea of systemic racism they think that they're actually doing good in the world they actually think that they're actually making life easier for marginalized people as they say or you know for um black people trans people to a certain extent women uh, whichever group is, is perceived to be marginalized. Um, they think that they're helping those people, but I don't think they are. And that's why I, I take issue with it. I think that they're actually harming those people because if like, you know, if you teach people that um, the world is against them, 
then you're, you're, you're going to destroy their confidence. You're going to destroy their ambition because you're going to make them think, what's the point? You know, you're going to, you're going to leave them in a despondent state. Uh, you know, if you teach black people, for instance, that, you know, oh, you know, you, you can't, you can't be what you want to be in life because the world is holding you down. I think that's a terrible message to give to young black kids. Uh, I think it's much better to, to teach them that, look, you can, no matter where you are, no matter what you're born, how you're born, no matter how much money you have, no matter what you look like, you can achieve something if you try hard enough. And that's the truth. That is the truth. You know, um, you know, Obama, for instance, he became the most powerful man in the United States. He was a black guy. He was at least he was he was mixed race, but he was he, he had he was perceived as a black person by by most people, and he became the most powerful man in America. Just goes to show you know, that if you if you really do have the drive, you can succeed. You can overcome if there is systemic racism in the world. And like I said, you know, there probably is some form of racism out there. Like that's. Um, negatively impacting some people some of the time but it's not strong enough that it's going to stop you from succeeding if you really want to succeed you know and that's the that's the important thing the way that the new york times and the washington post and, and wikipedia and hollywood and all these mainstream organizations the way that they portray it is that no matter how hard you achieve you know no matter how hard you struggle or um how how much you try or you know how motivated you are none of that stuff is going to allow you to rise above the the sort of systemic problems which is just is not true that's not true and so this is another way that that these sort of falsities in academia harm people um but there are many ways look there are many ways in which uh, the lies that are told by academics harm people because what they're doing is they're 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 harming people's ability to predict the future and when you can't predict the future that's that can cause you problems um and when I say predicting the future, I'm not talking about anything grand. I'm not talking about predicting what civilization will look like in the year 3000. I'm talking about just basic things like um, if you eat certain types of food, what's it going to do to your body? You know, um, if you work hard in life, where are you going to end up? So these are these are what I mean by predicting the future. And um, because academic academics are giving people a lot of false information, they are confusing people they are they're making people but worse at making decisions and so that in itself is a harm i think and and that's why it's it's something that we should strive to improve and you know i think we've been railing at academics quite a bit and I'm, i don't want to come off as somebody who's completely against academia or anything i i, I get a lot of my information from academia uh, i think that it is our it still is unfortunately our best source of information because even though they make a lot of mistakes, uh, academics make a lot of mistakes, it's still the most sort of systematized form of, of knowledge gathering. Um, if you compare it to what else we've got, you know, what else have we got? We've got watch YouTube videos or something, you know, or just, um, you know, I mean, some YouTube videos are good, yours are great, you know, <laughs> you can learn a lot from those, but but just watching YouTube as your primary source of information is not gonna, is not gonna be a great thing because you can't verify a lot of stuff you know what I mean whereas with academia you can at least like for instance the way I look at it is YouTube doesn't have a replication crisis you know it's not it's not actively looking at its own videos and saying oh we got we got this wrong do you know what I mean so one of the good things about academia is that it it is trying to correct itself it does have a replication crisis it's recognized it has a uh, replication crisis so it's trying to do better right um, the quality is very um, hit and miss in academic. You get some great studies, you get some really poor studies. I suppose that's similar to YouTube as well. You've got some really good YouTube, YouTube videos and you've got some really, really poor YouTube videos. So the, 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 the sort of range of quality is just too vast for it to be reliable. And that's the problem. But there is good academic work being done just as there are great YouTube videos and there are great newspaper articles. You know, I rail on the New York Times there are some great New York Times writers, some really good Washington Post writers, but because they are lost in all of the fuzz, you know, they don't, we don't get to really sort of get that information from them. We have to sort of sift through all the garbage in order to get to them. And that's real, that's really the problem um, is that there's so much garbage it's, that it's polluted the entire information landscape. And so 
even though there are great people out there doing great, great work, you know, who are really as far as you know, they're, they're rational as humans go. Even, you know, they are not enough because they're surrounded by so many irrational people that you just don't get to see their information most of the time. And that's one of the sort of the problems with these these issues is they mm. obscure even the people who are doing well. You know, academia is too large and too vast to um, be circumvented by good academics. It's, there's too many problems there. So, you know. Yeah, I, I've been around academia for decades now. And I've noticed, I think, one of the root causes of their bitterness, maybe, and their their resentfulness towards the world. And it stems from society doesn't really celebrate academics. I mean, these are people who worked really hard, and they're very smart, and they have these big egos and these big titles within their organization. But outside of their campus, society doesn't really care much about intellectuals. Society yeah. values meritocracy and greatness and, and people who take big risks. So we celebrate somebody like Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos monetarily. You know, they're the richest people on earth. We're not paying mm. the uh, humanities professor at Harvard million billions of dollars. You know, they're, so they kind of yeah. have this chip on their shoulder thinking, God, I'm so much smarter than these entrepreneurs. People are like, giving me credit. Yeah, yeah. yeah some absolutely. dumb guy, but yeah. now he's a billionaire. You know, why is he getting yeah. celebrated so much? I feel like there's a little bit of uh, animosity about that and about the priority. Like they feel like they should be getting celebrated. Why are these, you know, why is this social, yeah. why is this um, TikTok influencer in their kitchen getting more reach than me <laughs> when I just publish this paper, you know? Yeah, so there's, um, there's this thing called Sayers Law. Um, and basically uh, what, what Sayers Law is, is it's, it's, it basically states that the, the intensity of feeling in a dispute is inversely proportional to the value of the issues at stake. So uh, this was particularly, this was actually coined in response to academics and particularly uh, to, to the point that you just made. So one of the reasons why academ academics is so uh, fierce and so competitive is that the stakes are so low that uh, you know people are just not gonna they're not gonna care much what an academic thinks unfortunately you know it's, it's so and that makes academics angry because they're above average in intelligence but they don't feel like they're being uh, recognized as such you know they're like you know I'm smarter than you know 90% of, of human beings but nobody's recognizing me for that you know achievement and so I have to go out there and you know I have to really be loud and sort of ob obnoxious and boisterous just to get the attention and so I think that is one of the issues is that the stakes are so low that it, it makes them so sort of bitter and, and sort of fierce. Um, and again, this contributes to academics manipulating studies because they want to be recognized for their intelligence. So they want to come out with something grand and big and ambitious. And so they will tend to uh, engage in this bias where they will uh, manipulate results to be more extravagant than they would ordinarily be so it, it's an ego issue i think um and another ego issue i think with academics is um is what's known as the toothbrush problem so somebody once said and i've forgotten who it is that um theories that academics theories are like toothbrushes nobody wants to use anybody else's yeah so um they yeah <laughs> So they basically, you know, what they will do is because they want to be recognized for their own academic achievements, they will tend to sort of over over inflate their own theories. They will tend to, um, you know, big up their theories so that they can explain as much with their theory as could possibly be explained by it. And so that gives their theory more credence. It gives their theory more power. Uh, it allows their name to get out a bit further than it would ordinarily get. So, you know, you see this, uh, a classic example, I would say, would be um, Nicholas Nassim Taleb, where, uh, I mean, he's a very intelligent guy and I respect him quite a bit, even though he's a bit of an asshole. I do respect his intelligence. Um, but what he does is he tends to explain the current thing in terms of the book that he's working on. So, you know, the theory that he's currently working on, he'll explain the current thing using that theory. 
So, you know, he's got a few different theories which have all become sort of viral and become very popular. So one of his theories is skin in the game. One of them is um, anti-fragility. One of them is the Lindy effect. Um, one of them's black swans. So these are all theories that to do with sort of risk analysis because he's, he's a risk analyst. And what I found him doing, particularly on social media and in his books as well, is that he will look at something going on in the world and then what he will do is he'll find a way to explain that using his theory. So, you know, and, and you'll, you'll notice this happen with, um, like for instance, if, if let's talk about um, something like poverty, right? So poverty is a, a, an interesting topic because it has many different explanations, right? And if you are a, if you're a biologist, right? you will seek to explain poverty in terms of biology. So, you know, you explain it in terms of like um, sort of food, uh, food allocation um, and, 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 you know, just basically in terms of like, uh, you, you'd be looking at the, the more of the biological side of things, right? So um, if you are a sociologist, you'll be looking at the sociological aspects of poverty. So again, you know, things like um, sort of, uh, the economics of it, the, the sort of, you know, the, the, the ways in which um, humans organize and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, if you're a psychologist, you'll be looking at the psychological aspects and you'll be trying to explain poverty in terms of psychology. So, you know, you'll be saying, oh, you know, people get greedy and, you know, they, they, they want to have more and more and more. And, and then, you know, if you're an evolutionary psychologist, you're trying to explain it in terms of evolutionary psychology. If you're a social psych psychologist, you're trying to explain it in terms of social psychology. Um, and you see this a lot with these kinds of things where a person will try to explain a phenomenon based on their own sort of discipline. So it's, it's a, I think this is a sort of self-serving bias where they're trying to over inflate their own importance in a way. They're saying, oh, the thing that I've studied explains this, you know, it, I just happen to explain, you know, study the thing that explains the latest thing. So, you know, it's one of those uh, things that you see it a lot. I think once once you see it, you can't unsee it. You'll notice that pretty much everybody, right, no matter what field they're in, they will seek to explain as much as they possibly can with, with that explanation, with their theory. So I think this is also a, another bias, uh, not just amongst academics, but amongst pretty much anybody who's got expertise in anything. Um, and there's even a name for this, and it is, it's called the Golden Hammer. Uh, the, because it, it, it's called the Golden Hammer because it's... Uh, it's also called Maslow's Hammer as well. I think it might have been the same guy who came out with Maslow's Hierarchy uh, was also, I think, involved in, in, in the concept of the Maslow's Hammer. And it's basically the idea that, you know, when, you, when all you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. So, um, it, it, yeah, yeah, it, it, you know, the old saying. So, yeah, it, it's a concept known as the Golden Hammer or the Maslow's Hammer. And um, it's something that is, I think, another reason why people become irrational in that they they tend to favor their own explanations over the better explanations so there may be really really good explanations out there but if it's not your own explanation then you'll be less inclined to use that explanation uh, so yeah ego plays i mean ego i think is probably the biggest obstacle to truth i think of all of the different obstacles that you have i think ego is the biggest because it's you know because i think the truth is often just it, it, it's not um, it's not uh, conducive to ego and everybody wants to feel good about themselves and everybody wants esteem and everybody wants respect and all of these things and so in many cases the need for respect and for status and also for self-esteem as well those things override the search for truth even in fields like academia which is supposed to be all about finding the truth yeah, it seems like at the end of the day, we're all human and human nature wins in the end. It just seems like our human impulses, it's impossible to keep those out of studies, no matter how many times we try to do a double blind. Human biases just tend to show up and it's, yeah. it's, hard, to, it's hard to get rid of that. Um, I'd love to transition to a couple of other ideas that I, I love from you. Yeah, sure. Audience capture. I remember a few years ago, Chris Williamson, he texted me and he said, you have to read this right now. And I, I stopped everything I was doing and I read your article on audience capture. 
And man, that that blew me away because you know I'm Thank I you. consider myself somewhat of a influencer, I guess. I hate that word, but yeah. and <laughs> you know you made me realize you, you really sobered me up with that article. Like, who's doing the influencing? Is it me or or is it the audience? And maybe we could briefly just describe what audience capture is, and then talk about how that is spread beyond influencers. Yeah. So. Audience capture is when your need to be validated by your audience leads you to become a caricature of yourself. Uh, And how it does this is that you follow certain cues from your audience based on whether they like or dislike what you've posted or, or produced or whatever. And those cues lead you to double down on the things that made you popular in the first place, usually. So if you, you know, if you became famous for being outrageous, then your audience grows to expect that of you. And over time, you become trapped into that. You you have to do that again and again in order to fulfill your audience's expectations of you. Because if you don't, then it's considered being off brand. And, you know, you have to be on brand all the time. And so the need to be on brand and to sort of fulfill audience expectations causes you to just double down on the sort of the quirks of your behavior the things that you're known for and so in that sense that's how you gradually become a caricature of yourself you just become the sort of aspects of you that are loved become more exaggerated over time until they become cartoonish Um, and you're no longer yourself You're, you're now just a performance that is just repeating the same performance over and over again um or even worse, becoming more extreme over time um, in order to get the same high for, from your audience uh, in terms of, you know, the, 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 the likes and the retweets and the thumbs ups and all that. So it's, a, I think, an issue that all influencers face eventually when they get a large enough audience. Because everybody, again, you know, they want that, that esteem, they want the self-esteem, they want the respect, they want the status. And so... The search, the chasing of that status is, is really what leads to audience capture. Yeah, we, we've almost seen like a, a shift in priority where the digital world is now considered more important than what happens in the real world. And like a lot of things that yeah. happen in the real world are almost like performances for the digital yeah. world. Um, I keep a, a lot of, sadly, a lot of young women are getting um, plastic surgery. And I think some of it looks really freaky and somebody recently yeah. just told me hey, yeah it's not, it's not for the real world it's it's mm. for these pictures it's for this digital world and i'm like huh i never thought about that you know you have these yeah, uh, protesters scary, yeah. you have all these demonstrations happening they're kind of like performances so pe- the people that are doing these things are very aware that they're going to get recorded you know they're going to throw paint on a paint on a van gogh painting and destroy it if there mm. was nothing recording that they wouldn't do that performance, but this is all just like this show. And like you're saying, the most extreme behavior is getting the most likes, the most reward. And so that gets perpetuated. This extreme behavior gets mm. more and more extreme. And if they yeah. don't do something extreme, it's, it's off brand. Um, yeah. So how is this kind of, has this spilled beyond influencers though? Are we seeing it in, in other domains? Well, I think, it's it's a problem for influencers and and i think it's a problem for anybody who has an audience um of any kind you know anybody who's being watched um so there's there's a very interesting um research into this i mean so there's there's two ideas one of them's called the hawthorne effect and some psychologists dispute this but um but the hawthorne effect is, is named after hawthorne general electric i think which was a place where um, psychologists wanted to um, analyze um, some people, some workers, basically. So they just wanted to watch, sort of watch them. And, and I think they were, they were measuring something completely unrelated to, to what they eventually found. And what happened was um, what they noticed was that the, while they were monitoring these people, they were working a lot harder and they were behaving a lot different than they, than they normally would. And the psychologists didn't understand why this would be um, because it it sort of seemed to go against what they were trying to find. And so eventually they concluded that that it was the very act of being watched 
that was actually causing these people to change. And I mean, although that 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 story is is now being disputed, it's actually being found in many other avenues. There's the watching eye, the watching eye effect as well, which is um, when people behave differently in the presence of mere pictures of eyes. So it doesn't even require a living person to be watching you. You know, you you can just have pictures of eyes, and people will change their behaviour. And in the UK, police actually use pictures of eyes in order to deter crime because it's actually been found to do that and yeah uh, and and it's one reason why um you know people will, will have like just uh people just standing around uh, sometimes they're not even looking but just having people in presence of other people can actually change that those people's behavior so we have this natural desire to conform um to certain behaviors when in the presence of other people and I think this is probably an evolved social behavior. So it can happen even if you don't have an audience. If, you just, if you're just being watched, it can affect how you act. Um, this is something that happens to everybody. You know, we're all sort of partially constructed by uh, what we think other people want, want to see. Have you, have you heard so, of the uh, Panopticon? Yes, yeah. Yes, this that, is, yeah. you're making me think of the Panopticon, the, the structure yeah. that was first um, implemented in the prisons where you, yeah, yeah. the prisoners feel like they're being watched at all times and that makes them behave, essentially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly, yeah. And it's, uh, yeah, it's the, the power of, of being watched does completely change a person's behavior. Um, and it's, so it's, it's something that, it doesn't even require an online audience. It doesn't require uh, any of that area. But the thing is, is that what the, only, what the online audience does is that it makes it a lot more extreme it basically amplifies this effect a lot more and so what happens is because i think part of it is that you don't know who's watching you and you don't really know the nature of of what you're being what's being watched and what's not being watched and that confusion i think makes people a lot more vigilant about themselves because they're like a lot more they're a lot less certain and in the absence of certainty people become anxious so you know, you might not know exactly who who's watching you. You know, you could be watched by some crazy people, you know. And so that can make people a lot more careful about how they are perceived. And so that could be yeah. one part of it. And or, another or you part could be, of it is obviously... you could be being watched by people who really don't have your best interest at heart. They, exactly, want, yeah. they want to see you fall apart, you know. Yeah, yeah. And and so, yeah, and that that distance, I think, because if you're being watched by people that you know or just by people in your local neighborhood or, you know, then it's not it's not quite so bad because these people already, you, you know what they expect, you know who they are, you know, so you know what's going on in their mind while they're watching you. But when you, you know, when you're sort of on YouTube and you, you know, got a, a million subscribers and you don't know who's watching you, that can create a lot of anxiety for people and it can really make people worried about how they how they appear and that in itself can be a driver of audience capture in that, that anxiety makes you want to conform to, to your audience you know you want to be who your audience thinks you are because you're terrified that you know if you don't conform if you don't fulfill your audience's expectations of you then you know they'll, they'll unsubscribe or they might even sort of you know uh, lash out at you or, you know in your comment section or whatever you know and so um the anxiety i think is a big driver of it and also the need for status and the need for ego uh, that's also a big driver of it but what the, the the problem is is that both of these things ego and the anxiety these are both things that actually get worse with audience capture they don't get better they get worse because the anxiety gets worse because the more you the more you trap yourself in this certain sort of form of behavior the more pressure there is on you in future to to replicate that behavior so it becomes like a tightening sort of feedback loop that just gets tighter and tighter and tighter the more you do it the more people associate that behavior with you and the more they expect it of you in future and so it's like a, you know that puts more pressure on you and more anxiety because you have to be exactly like how your audience wants you to be and you become more and more controlled by your audience which itself causes mental harm to you you know over time you just feel i mean you know you look at people like nick ocado um, you know he's he's a he's somebody who was fully audience captured and he's now he claims openly claims he's unhappy um so that that's one thing and then also the status and uh, and all that sort of stuff 
in the short term, you might have a boost to your status and to your ego and to your self-esteem. But over the long period of time, what happens is that the more you become this person that you're not, the more you realize that you are not yourself anymore. You have to be somebody else in order to get respect. And when you realize that, that destroys your own self-esteem because you realize, well, I'm not good enough, so I have to be this pretend person in order to get respect. And so that feeling in itself is, is quite a crushing thing for a person to realize, where they realize that the distance between their online self and their off offline self, and that all of the love that they thought that they got, all of the respect that they thought that they got, it was actually intended for somebody who they are not, you know? And so that in itself is, you know, that's why the, the, the motivators of ego, you know, ego and anxiety, the two main motivators, I would say, of audience capture, they actually lead to both of these problems increasing in the long term. So it, it's not a good option for people to actually do this. I always say that you should just be yourself, not because it's gonna make you more likable, but because it's only by being yourself that you will find people who love you for who you really are than for somebody you're trying to be. And so that for me is, is why I just be, I'm just myself. I don't pretend to be anybody that I'm not because I don't want people to love who I'm pretending to be. I don't want people to respect who I'm pretending to be. I want them to love and respect me. And so the only way to do that is to be me, <laughs> you know? There's no other way to do that. Uh, and I'll get a lot of people who will hate me for being me. There'll be a lot of people who will disrespect me for being me. There'll be, you know, people who will mock me and ridicule me for being me. And that's fine. That's the, that's the cost of being you, you know? Um, I'm willing to pay that cost because I know that there will, pe there will be people who will like me and will respect me for being me, and that's enough. So um, I think that's, you know, that's for me is the main motivator why I avoid audience capture. Because it, audience capture does not resolve the problems that it is supposed to be resolving. It actually makes them worse. And um, the best solution is always to be yourself. It's also easier being yourself as well, because you don't have to act. You can just be who you are, you know? It's, it's simpler and it's better in the long term. Um, and also another thing is, is um, that nobody can be you better than you. So if you do choose to be just yourself, then you're kind of like, you can't be competed with, you know, in that respect, because nobody can be you as well as you. And so it, it cuts out the competition a little bit. You know, you've got this unique, everybody's got this unique sort of set of traits that's created by, you know, from all of the, the genes that they have and all of the experiences that they have, all of this complex entanglement of all of the things that have happened in their lives, that's created a very unique individual that nobody else can replicate. And so I think people should, you know, exploit that, make the most out of it, make the most out of the fact that you are completely unique. In a world of, you know, nearly 8 billion people, you're completely unique. And so why try to be somebody else? You know, when you have that one, that you have that unique selling point of just being you, you know? Yeah, well, like I was saying before, I, I think it's difficult now because the digital world is is taking priority over the real world. and if you haven't had the chance to step outside of the online world and, and like develop your own hobbies and figure out who you are, which is hard because we can never really know who we are. We're always changing. Mm. But if your online presence is, is more important than your real world, you're kind of, you're going to drift wherever that online audience is pushing you. And it's amazing how powerful that can be because you can, you can turn a hardcore liberal into a re Republican probably in like a week with just these, if their audience said, Hey, stop doing this. Like we want to see this now. Like I'm thinking about Nick Oca Nick Ocado. If his audience suddenly said, Hey, we don't want to see you gorge yourself anymore. We want to see fitness videos. Maybe in two months, he might be 200 pounds lighter and running marathons. You know, I think it's, it's that it has that powerful of, of an effect on behavior. This yeah. audience influence. It does. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I th think, yeah, I think again, it's, you know, it, I think one of the reasons why people are spending so long in the digital realm and why it's taking up so much of people's lives is again, I think it's anxiety and, and people are afraid of going out into the real world and, and making something of themselves in the real world. It's much easier and simpler and safer 
to just live online because you don't have to deal with anything in the real world, you know, and, and all your problems in the real world can easily be forgotten when you're just online and you're, you know, you're, you're performing for your audience or whatever, you know. And so I think it's a, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy in a way in that when you, when you sort of start becoming audience captured, it creates anxiety and that anxiety causes you to try and escape from all the anxiety so you try to escape from it by becoming this fictional person and mm. you know just performing and kind of leaving the real you with all the real problems of the real world behind and I think it's a it's a safety mechanism it's, it's a coping me mechanism but only one that helps in the short term again in the long term it just makes things worse and I think it's it's very difficult not to crack audience capture because it's it's irresistible in a way to for, for many people because it's it provides people with two of the things that they so much crave in in the digital world uh, it gives them sort of recognition and respect and it gives them an an, an escape from their anxiety so these mm. two things together i think make it a very powerful uh, incentive and it, it's why you've got to constantly be conscious of of who you are and, and, and what you're doing very powerful and, and on that note do you think TikTok should be banned um this is a a very complex topic so TikTok. i mean i'm generally not in the fan of of banning banning things i don't really like banning things um personally i don't think it's going to do a lot of good because the problem is not TikTok itself right the problem is the shift to ultra short term short form com content so it's stuff like instagram stories uh, the youtube shorts and um all of these other sort of ultra short like 10 second long videos i think that's the main problem so it's the problem's bigger than TikTok. TikTok is a problem though and it's a problem because it's under the influence of the chinese communist party which doesn't have the west's best interests at heart um, so now at the moment there is talk of, of banning TikTok and there has been for the past couple of years. Um, I think personally that TikTok should not be banned, but it should be taken out of the control of the Chinese Communist Party. And I think that's actually the, the route that the US government is seeking at the moment. They've offered, I think, ByteDance, which is the owner of TikTok, they've offered them a deal basically, which is sell your company to an American owner and we won't ban it. And I think that that's probably the best option for all of the parties involved, because what this means is that ByteDance will be reimbursed, so they will get money. They won't lose out. Uh, they'll get money. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party, by definition, because they uh, have a stake in TikTok, they will also get a pay payment. Uh, and uh, the American government will now have TikTok under American control. And everybody who is creating content and making a living on TikTok will be able to continue to do so. So I think that's the best option for everybody. Um, unfortunately, I don't think the Chinese Communist Party wants to do that. They don't want TikTok under American control because they know how powerful TikTok is as a as a means of propaganda and as a means of brainwashing um, and as a means of just manipulation generally. So China's not going to do that. I don't think they're going to agree to this deal. Even though ByteDance does want to do this, ByteDance's owner wants to do this because he knows that he can get a good pay payout. Uh, there is already a cons there is a consortium of uh, American uh, investors who are actually trying to stump up the money to buy TikTok right now, as we speak. Um, but I just don't think it's going to happen. And the reason is, like I said, I think China doesn't want Amer doesn't want an American TikTok, um, and so it's going to probably put the sort of pressure on America to instead ban TikTok. I think it's probably, if it doesn't, those are the two options, either either TikTok's gonna get banned or it's gonna get sold off. Those are, I think, the two options. I think neither of them solves the core problem, which is, as I said at the beginning, which is the this movement towards ultra short form video, because that's really what's causing the main the main problem. It's not, it's not the political broadcasting by the Chinese Communist Party. That's been happening for decades. Russia's been doing it. China's been doing it. India's been doing it. 
you know, they're all engaged in this propaganda war online. So it's, that's not the issue, right? It's not, it's not that, it's not even the privacy concerns because companies all over the world are constantly taking our data. They've been doing it since 2005, you know? Um, it's not, that's not an issue either. It doesn't really matter. I mean, all companies are now getting as much training data as they can because obviously AI is now a big thing and training data is like gold. So everybody's extracting data from us constantly. So that's not an issue either. So the main issue is not really any of these. It, the main issue is that it's atrophying people's brains. TikTok is atrophying people's brains because TikTok, what makes TikTok particularly dangerous, whereas other social media platforms are not, is that TikTok is all built around its algorithm, its central algorithm, which is a recommendation algorithm. And the entire um, app is built around that one algorithm, which is powered by AI. And what it does is it just, it finds the things that you are most addicted to. And the way it does this is very interesting. Um, I mean, there's, I don't know if this is 100% fact, but I've heard from quite a few sources that apparently it uses the camera or at least it was doing this. I don't know if it does it now because obviously there's a lot of pressure on TikTok now so you know, from the US government. So I don't know if they're doing it now, but I know, uh, uh, in fact, I, I'm 99% sure at one point what they were doing is they were using the phone camera to um, basically read people's features on to see their facial expressions as they were watching videos. Uh, and the reason I know this is because there were, there were quite a few um, sort of, there was Chinese reports which were showing that this is what they do. They were actually, th these were reports were submitted from ByteDance to the Chinese Communist Party and they were leaked. And uh, there were also, I think, um, I think it was The Verge or some, some other magazine, US magazine got hold of them and, and published them. And it showed like the, the ways that the, the TikTok algorithm works. And so uh, I'm pretty sure that this is what, this is what was happening. Um, and so it uses the, the, the camera to read your expressions, to know how uh, engrossed you are in a video. And that's one of the, the metrics it uses. It also uses uh, other metrics, like the, the more traditional metrics, like the videos that you've watched before. But another thing that it does is it also looks at your activity outside of the app. So it looks at the, uh, it, it scans your emails. <laughs> you know, it looks at what you've been reading about. It looks at what you've been writing about. Um, it looks at your, the websites you've been browsing, the apps that you've been spending the most time on. It looks at all of this stuff. So it does all of this stuff and then it builds up a picture of you, basically. It builds up a, uh, like a kind of a profile of you. And then based on that profile, it knows exactly what to show you because it looks at other people who have got similar profiles to you and what addicted to them, what was addicted to them. And then it basically addicts you using the same method. And then it uses a process of trial and error to sort of zero in on you. And so it's very, very good at what it does. It's very good at addicting you to things. And that's one of the problems. The second problem is how passive it is. So it's basically... It's the least interactive of all of the social media platforms. If you go onto YouTube, you have to click on a video. You have to choose a video and you have to click on that video and then you have to watch it, right? And you have to also, because YouTube videos are a lot longer than TikTok videos, you have to have an attention span to use YouTube, right? <laughs> Whereas with TikTok, you don't have to press any buttons. You don't have to follow anybody. You don't have to uh, friend anybody or anything like that. You know, you don't have to get recommendations from anybody except for the algorithm. Literally, all you do is you just open the app and immediately it starts showing you videos. And if you don't like the video, you just squit, skip it. If you like it, you keep watching and that's it. Those are the only decisions you make. And that is so dangerous because when you're not making any decisions, when you're just idly and passively browsing through the videos, you let your guard down and you become very, very vulnerable to manipulation because you're no longer passively, sorry, you're no longer actively engaging with the content. You know, the reason why reading is so good is because you have to actively engage with the words. You have to make sense of them in your mind. And that's why it's harder to be brainwashed from reading than it is from watching things. When you're watching, you're in a more passive state. And so your mind is not as active and because it's not as active, you're more malleable, you're more manipulable. And this can, especially when you consider that TikTok's main audience is young people who have impressionable, and particularly young girls, who are the most impressionable of all demographics. Um, that makes TikTok extremely dangerous as a way to sort of 
manipulate people. And when I say manipulate, I'm not talking about political manipulation. I'm not talking about uh, Chinese Communist Party manipulating people into becoming communists or anything like that. I don't fear that. I don't think that's the problem. I think the problem is, is it's manipulating you to seeing more and more content online, more and more of this mindless content. And what that does over the long term, according to some research um, by the national, um, by the NIH, um, it's, it's the... Um, what happens is when you browse, when you passively browse social media over years and years, it causes the grey matter in your brain to shrink and it leads to something called digital dementia, which is an umbrella term for uh, a variety of issues such as um, depression, anxiety, ADHD, lack of motivation, um, brain fog, all of the, like basically just a, a lowering, like a, a weakening of the brain, basically a weakening of the mind. and. Um, this has been associated, these two things, the, the reduction in grain matter in the brain and digital dementia, these things have been associated with long-term uh, passive social media use. Although, to give a caveat to that study, um, we don't, it's not like a fine-grained study, so we don't know exactly what's causing it. All we know is that if you live the kind of lifestyle that involves you spending a long period of time on a, on a phone, uh, then it can cause a reduction in, in brain volume. There could be um, something called collider bias here. So it might be that it's not actually the act of looking at your phone. It might just be sitting down for long periods of time. That could be causing it. Because we, we do know that being sedentary, lack of exercise, those things also cause it as well. So that could be contributing to it as well. So it might not be completely the thing. But the fact is, is that if you spend a huge amount of time just sitting still on your phone, it's going to cause a reduction in the volume of your grey matter in your brain, most likely and it's gonna increase your chances of getting uh, mental problems. And so that's the thing that I really fear. And why I fear it is because when I look at the path, the trajectory that humans have taken in terms of information consumption, um, it, it seems quite scary because the way that I look at it is look at the digital, like sort of the digital age is the latest in a long trend of uh, technological innovations which began with the industrial revolution um, so now okay so let's go back a hundred years ago right a hundred years ago uh, the main ways in which people consumed electronic information was through cinema cinema was the main one because people didn't have TVs in their in their homes so people would go to the movies you know uh, and and they'd watch like two hour one hour long movies and they would do it very rarely and that was that was how people got their information, their, their digital, uh, not digital. That's how they got their electronic information. And then fast forward like uh, 40 years. So from the 1920s to the 1960s. Now the primary mode of electronic information consumption is TV. So so now pretty much everybody's got TVs in their in their living rooms uh, and they're watching shows that are a little bit shorter so you know maybe half an hour long um 45 minutes long so there's been a reduction in the size of the thing that they're seeing and, and also they're seeing it more often because now it's in their living room now let's for fast forward uh let's say 80 years well not 80 years let's say 60 years so 60 years so no not 60 years, another 40 years right so let's go forward another 40 years so let's go to the 2000s right so now in the 2000s, we've got YouTube. So YouTube's taken the next step. So now, um, instead of watching cinema, instead of watching TV, the primary mode of electronic information consumption is to watch YouTube videos, which are usually in the region of uh, around 10 to 20 minutes, sometimes longer. Um, and people will watch those. And now people are watching those a lot more often than they were watching TV. But now let's go another four, another 20 years forward and now we've got TikTok which is continuing this trend and now we've got seconds long videos instead of minutes long videos and they're constantly being watched constantly on your phone you know what I mean like so what you'll notice is with this trend going from cinema to TikTok the content that we're consuming is getting shorter and it's getting more frequent and this is not a good trend because this is precisely the kind of thing that apparently leads to the loss of grey matter 
and the rise of mental illness. And there is weirdly, there is a correlation here because if you look at from the point at which TVs were put into everybody's homes, uh, from the first generation that grew up with that, there was a Norwegian study which found that IQ has been dropping since the 1970s um, of everybody. So, so the national average IQ has been dropping gradually. And it, it can't be explained by uh, immigration. It can't be explained by chemical pollutants, at least as far as we can tell. Um, those might be those might be uh, factors, but the there's a large unaccountable uh, factor here, mathematically speaking. And I would say that the missing factor is the sort of shift to shorter and shorter forms co of content, um, which is also becoming more frequent consumption of content and also more brain dead content as well. It's, it's also this is another thing is a TikTok's content is extremely brain dead. A lot of it, not all of it, but a lot of it. Like uh, if you go on there and you look at the most widely consumed TikTok videos, the most popular TikTok videos, you've got stuff like Bella Porch, uh, who just basically does lip syncing, um, you know, and twerking and, and all that kind of stuff. Just, you know, like the most brain dead stuff that you can think of, you know what I mean? Um, so this is also a big factor, you know. Um, if the content is intellectually stimulating, then it doesn't matter if it's short. It doesn't matter that it's you're watching it all the time because you're still learning. So, for instance, your your animations are great because they're actually really well made, short pieces of art with a clear message that actually makes people wiser. So you're wiser after watching one of your videos than before watching it. You learn something about the world. So if I were to watch nothing but your videos all day, I'd actually learn quite a lot of stuff. The problem with TikTok and with a lot of YouTube content is it's just it's, it's like stuff that's basically designed to appeal to your worst impulses so it's stuff that's either it's going to be sexually gratifying or it's going to be um pranking you know p pranking people like jokes humor and, and all that sort of stuff like you know uh, or it's going to be um just like a culture warring stuff like really like enraging like to make you as angry as possible um or you know it's just going to basically gonna be preying on your your base emotions and when you're constantly watching that kind of content over a long period of time, that's going to have it's going to have effects over your it's going to have effects on your mental health. It's going to make you, um, you know, if, if you're constantly watching enraging like rage bait, you're, you're going to be stressed out. You're going to be angry all the time. You're going to be you're not going to be a happy person. So that's what I fear from yeah. TikTok. It's a bit of a took a bit of a, 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 a another uh, uh, tangent from TikTok, but yeah, I mean, that's what, what I fear from TikTok is that it's it's the very, very long term stuff and not just of TikTok, but of this movement towards shorter and shorter forms of content. That's the thing that we need to be looking at, not TikTok itself. TikTok is just a symptom of this bigger problem, I think. Mm. That's very well put. And you, you packed a ton of great information there. That's really made me think. So this trend from like cinema to TV to laptops to phones to now TikTok. I don't see how things can get any shorter. I've never been on TikTok because mm. I, I look at it like digital heroin. But yeah, yeah. from what I understand, the videos are like under six seconds, right? Or yeah, many of them so are short. Yeah, just I don't, a few seconds long. Yeah. And, and people spend like eight hours a day on it. So they're super short and you spend an incredibly long time period of time like could, how how could it get even shorter and longer? Like, could we get half second videos and you're on it for 24 hours a day? Like, is that even possible? Well, I think where does this go? I think I think where it's going to go is towards not towards shorter, but towards more immersive. So uh, you probably heard of the Apple Vision Pro and MetaQuest right. Three, both products uh, released this year, I think, um, which are basically headsets that you wear, which give you extended reality as it's called or xr for short and this is basically where you have a display superimposed upon your field of vision so you can go out to the shops you can go to the grocery buy groceries or whatever and it will tell you the prices of all the products by superimposing them electronically over all the products and you know that kind of stuff so this is the next step this is where it's going to go from having a phone in your hand to having a phone strapped over your face <laughs> so that you can't escape it, do you know what I mean? And it's gonna be constantly there. And then 
that's going to mean that you're going to be more immersive. You're going to be watching a lot more of these kinds of videos because you can watch them while you're even just walking in the street. You could have your field of vision and you could have like a small section there which will be playing TikTok videos. So you could, you know, be constantly, it's just going to be constant simulation. You'll be, you'll be maybe jogging and you can watch YouTube videos while you're jogging. You know, you could, it's going to be crazy. And um, it's, it's just going to lead to, like the one, the one thing that was keeping people from um, being completely addicted and spending their whole life on TikTok was real world needs. So, you know, you can't spend all day on TikTok because you've got to eat, you've got to, you've got to make money, you've got to uh, see your family, you've got to, you know, you've got to do all these things that, you yeah, you've got to go to sleep, you know, you, you've got the real world constantly calling, you know, because there are real world needs to be met. But what if you can watch TikTok whilst meeting all of your real world needs? And that's the problem that, you know, now you don't need to, you know, you, you don't need to do one or the other, you can do both, you know, so you can go to work and you can do your work while you're watching YouTube videos or TikTok videos or whatever. So that's, I think, where it's headed. And also, I think ultimately where it's going to get really scary is when um, instead of watching this stuff, you're getting it downloaded directly into your brain. Because we know, you know, Elon's obviously been doing stuff with Neuralink um, and there have been experiments now where I think there's a guy who had a microchip installed into his brain, which allowed him to receive signals um, in the form of like um, basic sort of shapes or things that he could see, I don't know, but they're, they're, he was receiving signals from uh, electromagnetic radiation. So Wi-Fi, basically, he had Wi-Fi in the brain. And um, I think in the future, it may be that you won't even have to watch them. You won't have to watch videos. You'll just get them downloaded instantly into your brain so that you can dream them, you can imagine them. That's going to be very, very peculiar, but that's going to be probably the next step. And I wonder how that's going to affect people where you can probably have a library of media stored in your memory. And, you know, you could, then you could just spend your whole day in your head. You wouldn't even have to leave your head. I mean, this is getting a bit science fictiony, but it's it's uh, you know this is this is stuff that this is the kind of world we're living in now, where even science fiction is yeah. sounding plausible, you know. Um, but that seems to me to be the next step. Uh, yeah, because I, it's it's there's... it's greater immersion, isn't it? That, that that's that's where the that's where the line is going. It's growing towards greater and greater immersion. So, yeah, totally. Like twenty years ago, we had this idea in all our movies that AI was going to be this. Um, strong, forceful thing that would uh, take us over by force, like through a military. And there were videos mm -hmm. like Terminator where you'd have uh, Skynet, the main yeah. characters <laughs> are fighting these like real life robots in reality. But it seems more likely now that AI is just going to emerge into this super effective algorithm that can keep us hooked for forever. And maybe that's how humanity just fades away is like we're just well, maybe we won't fade away because the AI will need to keep us alive in order to justify its existence. But, you know, that's get, it gets yeah. sci-fi really fast. But yeah, yeah. as a, I wanted to transition to this question. As a journalist, how do you, what, what is your opinion on other journalists using AI to write their articles? Okay, so... I mean, I, I wouldn't. I probably wouldn't describe myself as a journalist. I'd probably just call myself a writer because, for me, a journalist is somebody um, who reports, who just reports on things. Um, whereas what I do is I try to give my opinion on things. So I'm more of a commentator than a journalist. Um, but I, I guess I guess that doesn't really change your question much. So um, I am against the use of AI for writing um, for several reasons. Um, one of them is that I still don't think AI can do a, as good a job as somebody who's really trying to write something good. Uh, AI can do well; it can it can write as well as a human, as an average human. But if you're an average human, if you write like an average human, you shouldn't be a journalist. You shouldn't be a commentator. Do you know I mean you should be you should be doing something else? <laughs> um, and so, if AI can write better than you, you shouldn't be writing as a living, uh, as a professional. That's that's my my take. That's the first thing that I would say. Um, but the second thing is, I think it's actually bad for 
people in general. I think um, for several reasons. The first reason is that the way that AI writes is that it has a very predictable way of approaching things. Uh, it tends to be very mealy mouthed. It tends to be very both sidesy and very, um, you know, kind of like, oh, well, this is one perspective, but you can also look at it from this perspective. And, you know, uh, that's one way of looking at it kind of thing. It, it tries to be very fair, but it tries to be so fair that it ceases to be human. And one of the points of writing is that you're supposed to actually have a point. You're supposed to put forth a perspective. And yeah, you'll be biased. That's your job. You're supposed to be a little bit biased because all writing is biased. Like you, you're biased in the in the topics that you choose to write about, in the um, perspective that you choose to hold, in the things that you choose to include and not include. All of these things are forms of bias. It's impossible to not be biased. Um, so the thing with AI is it tries to not be biased because that's how it's been programmed. Like the the people who program AI, they're so afraid of AI bias that they've basically just made it say everything and nothing. And it tends to, you know, tends to be very vapid. You can, I can spot a lot of the time when something's been written by AI because it's just it just too mealy mouthed. You I mean it doesn't really um, it doesn't commit to any perspective other than the, the the usual social justice stuff. You know, it's always about you know black black lives matter, trans lives matter, all that kind of stuff because obviously that's been programmed in. But all of the other stuff, it doesn't really have any um, it doesn't have any daring opinions on anything it's all of its opinions are super safe and they're super bland for that reason so for that reason i would be against it so from a purely content point of view it's bad but from another point of view i'm also bad i also think it's bad because i think when you rely on ai to write for you you become a worse writer yourself because writing is how we sort of crystallize our thoughts it's how we confront ourselves and it's how we realize who we are. We get to know who we are by writing because our thoughts go from a place that we have no knowledge of. They come from a secret attic or a basement within ourselves and they emerge out into the open when we write. You know, I don't know how many times this has happened to you, but it happens to me all the time where I won't know what I think about something until I actually sit down and write about it. And then... I begin writing and I know nothing about what I believe. And by the time I finish writing, I now have a solid idea of what I believe. Because the thoughts that were in my basement, in the basement of my soul, I would never have been exposed to those ideas if I hadn't put them out into the open, onto the page. And so it's actually a way of us getting to know ourselves, writing. So it has, it has purposes other than just communicating. Writing is not just about communicating to other people. It's also about communicating to yourself. And it's also about clarifying your thoughts and making yourself a better thinker. I always say that to practice clear thinking, you should practice clear writing. Because when you, when you practice how to make good sentences, that's when those sentences become thoughts. And you, be, you begin to think in good sentences. And because, you know, like most of our thoughts take the form of sentences. You know, we all, well, most of us have like an internal monologue, uh, a stream of consciousness. And when you are bad at writing, that also is reflected in your thoughts. Like your thoughts have bad, they're loose, weak sentences, uh, imprecise sentences. But when you are, when you practice writing and when you sharpen your ability to sh form sentences, then the sentences in your mind, the ones that form your thoughts, also sharpen. And so you become a better thinker by becoming a better writer. But if you're using AI to do all this for you, you're not practicing and sharpening those skills that make you a good thinker. And so people who rely on AI will, in the end, not just become bad writers, but they will become bad thinkers. And I think that's one of my big problems with AI is that it, it's so good at motiva uh, motivating us to be lazy in a way. You know, it basically makes us, it makes us lazy. Um, that it just, it can, because it, if, if we rely on it, then we're going to lose our own abilities. And that is something that I fear quite a bit. And that's why I, I won't ever use AI to, to write things, uh, because I don't want to lose my own abilities. That was a fantastic answer. And thanks. Yeah, it was an absolutely brilliant answer. And I completely agree about the writing thing. I, I You just made me, you inspired me to want to write more. I try to write, whenever I get like a, a a dash of inspiration. I try to write it in my notes. And what that does is it, 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 it kind of astounds you because 
you realize that the dash of inspiration or the thought you just had is really very incomplete and sitting down and having to write it out forces you to like provide enough context to introduce the idea. And then it also forces you to like bring that idea to completion. And sometimes you'll hit a wall and you'll say, Hmm, maybe that idea wasn't really that fleshed out. I need to, you know, I need to question myself or, Go back to the drawing yeah, board. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, writing really helps you as a thinker and a speaker, for sure. Yeah. And going back to the TikTok thing, if you're watching all these few second videos that are produced to you by an algorithm, it's gonna scramble your brain and make it very hard for you to think in, in coherent long form ways or complete an idea. And yeah, if, if you were having AI curate your thoughts, then it makes sense that writers are going to have AI do their thinking for them as well. Yeah. So absolutely, it is concerning for sure. And I'm curious to see how this pans out. Like, do you think the, like we're seeing several large institutions falling right now because they got caught using AI to write their articles. Uh, I believe Sports Illustrated is uh, just went out of business wow, because, yeah. and wow. right before they went out of business, there was this scandal that found that almost all their articles or a bunch of their articles were written by AI, and some of them are just pathetic. <laughs> like I saw some of them, it wow. was like okay. there was an article about volleyball, and it was like a Wikipedia article about volleyball. It was like oh, volleyball no. is a great well. sport. <laughs> you want to make sure that the ball is inflated. It's like who yeah. wrote this? <laughs> Who's this for? You know. Wow. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, uh, yeah. Yeah. I was just, I guess say, I have, uh, sorry. Okay. Oh, sorry. I just, I thought we could maybe end on a more positive note because we've, we've definitely covered the dystopian direction we're going in. I was wondering yeah. how you find common sense in a, a senseless world. So I, I spend a lot of time now, um, away from media, uh, away from all electronic devices. Um, one of the things that I've been trying to do is actually a bit of a crazy thing, but one thing I do now is um, I will, for each each day, I will get my chair, this chair here, and I'll face the wall and I'll just sit in silence, just facing the wall. And I'll do that. I've I only started doing it recently, but I, I, I do it for like 10 minutes a day. And I'm gonna gradually work work my way up. It's very, very hard. It is extremely hard. I began doing it just one minute and then I went from one minute to two minutes, then went from two minutes to five minutes, and now five minutes to 10 minutes. And then I'm gonna go 10 minutes to 20 minutes. It's very difficult. It is very, very difficult to do that because we're so used to constant stimulation that we we just kind of like need it now. We feel like we need it. You know, we, we need some we need some noise, we need some light, we need something. So I had, it took me time and it took me struggle to get over the mental sort of uh, barrier to do it but I, I managed to do it and it was incredible because when you're just alone with your thoughts you just become so much more aware of everything you become more aware of things happening in, in your world and in your life and you get to know yourself a lot better and I find that I'm just so much of a better person when I do that it's like it's almost like meditation but it's not even meditation it's just literally just facing the wall and just thinking and just being alone with your thoughts so that's one thing I do. I think it sounds crazy, but it, it's, it, it really does do wonders. I, I do that. I also try to spend time in nature. Um, and I, you know, go I put music in my earphones and I go for walks in nature. Um, I find that spending time away from the internet, spending time away from electronic devices helps to sort of calm me and, and to keep me on a level playing field. So I'm kind of like, you know, I'm not, I think anxiety is, is a big issue for me particularly. And I think anxiety and emotions generally are what cause me to become, to lose sense. I lose sense when I'm emotional and particularly when I spend too much time on social media. You know, I get angry because I see something, because I know that there's rage bait constantly. And the funny thing is, I know the, the methods that are used to manipulate me, but I still get manipulated. Do you know what I mean? So I know that there's rage bait. I know that there's, I know that there's these articles that exist only to make me angry. But when I read them, I still get angry, you know. <laughs> and so I try to stay away from all of that stuff, for, you know, and just spend more time on the little things, focusing on the little things. 
I've learned to really appreciate small things. Like I was on a podcast with Chris Williamson and I was telling him how when I was grocery shopping and I saw a tomato and it was just such a lovely tomato and I just decided to really appreciate that tomato. Just one tomato. And I really thought about that tomato. I thought about all the work that had gone into making that tomato, into, into growing that tomato. Not just the, the grower himself who, or herself who grew it, but... The, the people that established farming, the people that established irrigation all through history, you know, uh, all the families that taught uh, farming to the next generation, to their sons and daughters, you know, who taught it to their sons and daughters and the people who invented uh, fertilizer and all of these things, all of this stuff and the people who bred different species of tomatoes, the cultivars and all that, all of that stuff went into making that one tomato. And it's like the ingenuity of humanity in this one little perfectly created globe of like loveliness <laughs> and so I sort I just sat there just it was just me and that tomato right it was me and that tomato and I just appreciated it I just really because I like the taste of it it was a really nice sweet it was a really well high quality it's an heirloom tomato they're quite high quality tomatoes and I just um, you know I had some balsamic vinegar and, and a bit of cheese and you know I just really just sat there in silence I had no, nothing else and it was just me and that and I just really really took I made the most out of it and enjoyed it and since I've started doing that and really focusing on what I have and really appreciating it and trying to see it with new eyes, I found that my life is so much more fulfilling because I used to I used to be depressed. I used to have anxiety. I used to have depression. Um, I don't have any of that stuff now. I, I appreciate every single moment of my life now as much as I can. You know, and the way one of the ways that I do it is I have this thing called the finality principle where I just imagine that whatever I'm doing, that it's the last time I'm ever going to do it. And that really puts it into perspective because it could be, it could be the last time I ever do it. Like if I go and, you know, if I see my family, for instance, I wonder to myself, what if this is the last time I ever see my family? You know, if it's that tomato on that plate, what if that's the last tomato I ever eat? And doing that really, really puts things into perspective for you. It makes me appreciate things so much more. You know, I always wonder, like, how many sunsets will I, will I see in my life? How many more sunsets, you know? When I think about it, I don't really see sunsets very often. So maybe I'll see four, four or five more sunsets in my life. And it doesn't sound like a lot when you think about it like that. So I try to appreciate, you know, I try to appreciate things as much as I can. And, um, you know, think that is the cure getting away from all this nonsense on the internet you know there's so much nonsense there's so much information overload there's this constant you know it's con your screens are constantly vomiting out all this information over you and i think that if you want to if you want sense you've got to step back from all of that stuff and just appreciate the basic things in life and i think from that when you get that sort of mental calmness that's when you can begin to be a sensible person because I think emotions are the biggest obstacle to sense and to rationality. And a lot of content online is designed around getting you emotionally unstable. They're trying to get an emotional reaction out of you. So take a step back from all of that, appreciate things in life and just learn to just live just basic life. I think that's, and when you can do that, then you can move on to everything else. Yeah, and that's, so that's one thing I do. And then um, another thing is I think there's two qualities that one needs if one wants to pursue truth and one of those is curiosity and one of them is humility um, so curiosity I think is is a crucial thing because once you have curiosity then no answer is the final answer then you're there's always more there's always more you always keep looking you know when you cease to be curious you become certain and when you become certain i always say certainty is the death of thought you know that's when you stop thinking when you're certain and so curiosity keeps you thinking it means that you never ever get to that point where you stop thinking and so i would say be curious and you can't just be curious right um so i can't just say to you be curious and then you're oh okay i'll be curious you know so it doesn't quite work like that so you have to um you have to make yourself curious and the way that you make yourself curious the way that i make myself curious at least is that i learn a lot about a little so i like to read about i've started to, you know i've acquired a taste in learning 
lots of things, uh, you know, reading trivia, general knowledge. And what happens is that curiosity is the gap to fill, it is, sorry, curiosity is the need to fill gaps in knowledge, right? So in order to be curious, you need to have something to have gaps between. So, you know, if you, you need to have these little sort of things that are anchors that you can uh, sort of hang your, your curiosity on it, as it were. So you've got to, if you, so if you learn something about, if you, if you know nothing about something, you're not going to be curious. But if you learn something about that thing, then you'll be eager to know a bit more because you'll have questions now, you know. So the knowing a little about a lot will give you a lot of questions and having a lot of questions will make you curious. So collect questions is my is my advice collect questions get you know just, just basically learn a little about a lot and ask yourself questions about those those little things that you've learned and that will spur you to know more so that's how i get myself curious uh, the other thing that you need i think to to be a, a rational person is is humility and that's because again as i said earlier ego is the biggest obstacle to truth. Ego and emotions, those are the two things. Um, and one of the reasons why we don't become uh, rational is because we're, we're too busy thinking about status, uh, respect, esteem, uh, you know, we want all of that stuff. And so we, you know, like going back to what we were saying earlier, that, that proves a big obstacle to truth. And so the way out of that is to become humble. And again, I can't just say to you, oh, be humble. And then, oh, oh, okay, I'll be humble. It's not going to work like that. So you have to make yourself humble. And the way that I make myself humble is I just remind myself of that I'm just an ape. You know, I'm an ape that uh, is going to be on this earth for a few decades. And that's it. That's pretty much it. Um, and I, I think about like, you know, I don't, I don't think of that as a negative thing. I mean, it can be depressing to some people. I don't find it depressing. Um, I find it quite a funny thing, actually, to be honest. When I regard myself as just an ape, I feel a lot more relaxed with myself. I don't, I'm not so hard on myself when I make mistakes. You know, I'm not as, um, I don't pressure myself. I don't put as much pressure on myself. I'm more chilled, I'm more at ease because I'm like, okay, I'm an ape. You know, I try to do well. I, try, I do try to do good things. I try to get things right. But I know that because I'm an ape, I'm going to get things wrong. So, you know, I'm not, I have 99.9% .9 of the same DNA as, as a chimpanzee. Well, actually, not 99.9, .9, but 99%. I have 99% of the same DNA as a chimpanzee. So, you know, of course, I'm going to get things wrong. Um, so always remember that. And, you know, obviously, not everybody believes that they're, a, they're an ape. Some people won't believe that. Some people uh, believe that they're, you know, a, a fallen angel. But... Even if you believe you're, you know, if, even if you're religious or whatever, you can still make yourself humble because you can then in that case, you can say to yourself, well, I'm just, you know, I'm imperfect. I was, I was I'm an imperfect offspring of Adam and Eve or whatever, or, you know, um, whatever religion you are, I'm sure you can find a way to make yourself humble. Right. Um, so that, that that's the first thing. And then another thing is, is also to bear in mind that I, I love what um, one of my, in fact, is my favorite email of all time is an email that Steve Jobs sent to himself. Uh, it's just such a beautiful email. Um, he was basically, I think Steve Jobs uh, had a problem with humility, especially as he got bigger. Um, you know, he basically sort of just decided to be, he decided to, to remain humble as, he, as, he, as his profile got bigger. And I've got his email here um, which I'll read out to you. Oh, it's, 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 just, it's just such a beautiful email and I think it's great to to end on um, because it, it's a beautiful email. Um, I can just get it up. So basically, yeah, so what he was saying is he, he had an email that he posted to himself and I think he, he stuck it on his wall because he was like... Um, he was afraid of becoming hubristic because he, you know, he became such a big figure in culture that he didn't, you know, he just felt like he was going to become arrogant and he would lose touch with his humanity. So he, he wrote this email and he sent it to himself. So I'll read out the email to you. So um, he posted this to himself. So this is the email. I grow little of the food I eat and of the little I do grow, I did not breed or perfect the seeds. I do not make any of my own clothing. 
I speak a language I did not invent or refine. I did not discover the mathematics I use. I am protected by freedoms and laws I did not conceive or of leg legislate and do not enforce or adjudicate. I am moved by music I did not create myself. When I needed medical attention, I was helpless to help myself survive. I did not invent the transistor, the microprocessor, objective-oriented programming, or most of the technology I work with. I love and admire my species, living and dead, and am, am totally dependent on them for my life and well-being. Wow. So that's, that's beautiful. That's the email that he, he posted to himself in order to remind himself to be humble. And I think it's a, a beautiful yeah, thought. That. It doesn't just make one humble, but it, it also can help you love humanity again when you, you know, when you lose faith in humanity. Um, it's a good way of restoring it. Just thinking about that. Yeah, that's brilliant. I mean, we are standing on the shoulders of giants. And yeah. you're either driven by resent, resentment or you're driven by gratitude. And yeah. if you're driven by gratitude, your life is just in alignment and just the simple act of giving thanks for what you have and what's been given to you can completely just shift your energy immediately. So, yeah, yeah, I'm going to have to look that, that letter up and probably print it out and tape it on the wall here because it's a yeah. wonderful yeah, reminder. Yeah. I always come back to it. Um, yeah. Thanks for, thanks for telling me that. Uh, there's a bunch of other things I wanted to get into, but I think we covered, I mean, we had a, we actually only covered like two of the questions or three of the questions I had, but <laughs> our conversation just yeah. naturally went on. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I can I tell, I can tell it's quite a bit. Yeah. It's great. But like we were talking about before with how writing improves your ability to think deeply, it's clear that you've done a lot of just introspective. You've like looked within you've, and you've had time to just take your ideas to the completion, which is great because you can Thank just you. go on forever. Yeah. Um, hmm. I guess my last question is, is like as a writer, you're, it seems like you're seeing the trend of people's attention span just withering away. Are you getting outside of writing more? Are you like going to start making, do you make videos? Do you like, are you going to try to put it's your ideas It's something I've else? been wanting to do. I've been wanting to do that for such a long time. I'd love to make videos um, and to do other sort of forms of media. Absolutely is on my radar. Um, I will eventually get around to it. Um, but over the sort of past few months, I've been preoccupied with this mammoth essay that I've been writing, a huge one, which is going to be published soon, by the way. Um, but it's is a really long one. It's not going to be job? good for the. Yeah, yeah, it is now. Yeah. <laughs> so I've got, a, a, obviously, I'm working on a book as well and um, been doing that. But um, yeah, this next article is, is probably the most ambitious thing I've ever written. And it's going to be published soon, finally, after all this time. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to be focusing on Substack um, yeah. in the foreseeable future. Uh, writing is probably what I do best, so I'll be putting most of my energy into that. But I will try to move into other domains, too, because uh, I just want to do it just for the experimentation, uh, I think. Yeah, and I, I could see totally see you, on, I could see you on Lex Friedman, No Problem, and Joe Rogan. Right. I think you'd be an awesome guest yeah. on, on those podcasts. Thanks. Yeah. So um, thanks for taking the time. And our collaboration comes out tomorrow. And so yeah, will this podcast. Wait. So I'm really excited to awesome. see the reaction to that uh, that episode. I think it's going to be, I think it could, could go viral. I feel it. I hope so. That'd be great. I'm sure yeah. it will. It's a brilliant animation. You did a great job with that one. It, it'll upset the right people. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, anything yeah. worthwhile doing is always going to upset somebody. It's, it's just the way. Yeah, you can't tell the truth without offending some people. Yeah.